Hey everybody, it's the first day of PAX. I'm not there, of course, not yet. Uh, it's only like 5.30 in the morning, and I'm just getting ready. I, no, I'm pretty much ready. I'm just, this is as much an equipment test as anything else, but uh, I'm in my hotel room. It's really nice here. It looks really dark, of course, but uh, that's just because lighting in hotel rooms is always kind of dark, so I'm sorry if it's a little shady right now. Um, I had a few things to talk about. I was actually going to do this yesterday, but honestly, yesterday was the first day I'd slept in like two and a half days, so... I'm looking. I'm feeling pretty good now. I got like eight hours of sleep in, so I'm good. I got my media pass the day before, and uh, I'm really overwhelmed. Actually, I, I felt really bad about myself. I, I kind of had this real moment of like, oh, or like um, this one guy recognized me in the hotel lobby, and he's this journalist. Um, who was he for? He's for. Actually, doesn't say. He says he's for the Village Voice, but uh, like JoystickDivision.com. Yeah. Met this guy and he's like, uh, he's like, what do you got lined up? I got, I was like, I got, uh, I, I got some interviews lined up. I got basically like demos with game companies. I got three or four things a day. I got like three things on, three or four things every day, because the three days of the thing. He's like, he's like, really? He's like, man, I, I have so many things lined up. I have so many interviews. I didn't even book time to eat. I was all, I, I said, really? I, like, I responded to basically every press. Uh, the w when you're on the press list. Game companies basically announce things. They're like, uh, you know, come see Portal 2, and we'll go see Portal 2. So I made reservations to see basically every single game company there was on the list, and I, I still, I got, you know, like nine to ten different demos. That's not bad. That's a lot. But this guy, he's like, I got like 30 things lined up, and I'm doing an interview with Warren Spector. And if you don't know, Warren Spector is doing the uh, the keynote address for the the entire convention. I'm going to try to see if I can see that. Um, I'm actually not sure I'll be able to just because that comes up. It's like 10.30 to 11.30 and I have an interview at 11. So I may have to miss the keynote, which is a shame. And honestly, there's so much to see at this convention. That's what really overwhelmed me at first when I saw this thing was uh, the list of things to see. And that's not even talking... Like if you were just to see the, uh, the various... Uh, addresses, panels, and stuff like that. The panels for three days are booked beginning to end. Like, that, I, I was really hoping I was... I tried to get a panel book for this one, but I came in too late in the game. I was like, I, I came in like a month and a half before the show. And they weren't even listening to requests for panels. They were like, we're done, we're full. Like, we, there's nothing. So I tried to get a, to get a panel here. Um, but in fan gatherings... Uh, the, I was gonna do a fan gathering, but I honestly, there's there's really not many places to do it. There's like a GameWorks across the street. I thought maybe I could do a GameWorks fan gathering, but eh. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys will recognize me anyway. I'll be the guy with the big honking camera. You'll see me. I'm wearing my Samurai Zombie Nation t-shirt, my my uh, professional journalist uniform. Um, so yeah, like you could stay, you could do the whole show and just cover the panels. And honestly, that's why I'm, I'm not covering the panels, just because I have lots of different game things. And besides that, I don't know if they allow recording of the panel. So I, I didn't want to be the guy with the camera to get thrown out because I had a camera and, you know, things like that. Oh, yeah. And the other thing that really overwhelmed me was, there's a lot of movies I want to see this week. So, this cup, like, this, there's the show, there's wrestling, and then there's the movies. There's, um, I really wanted to see The American because I'm a big I'm a big George Clooney fan. I'll admit it. Um, I really liked. Uh, well, now I can't remember the name of the fucking movie. Um, the movie where he plays like the corporate lawyer. Fuck! What was it? It's really early in the morning for me. It'll come to me in a minute. Like when I. What is it? The movie where he plays the lawyer. You know, the, the, the fixer dude. Fuck. Um, anyway, so like I really want to see the American. And I uh, really wanted to see Machete. Angry Joe, so fired up about Machete. He's probably like... I, you know, I'm pro there's there's a theater, like, I can see it right out the window, right across the street. I might, when the convention's over, just go see Machete. Um, that is honestly one I'm not... I'm looking forward to it, but I'm really not thinking it's going to be any good. Just because it's 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 got... Jessica Alba and Lindsay Lohan in it. And my point was, like, how good could it be? <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be any good. 
Yes, that's me going into the theater with a bad attitude. Although, I have been pleasantly surprised more often than not. Which leads me to... I saw Brad's review of The Last Exorcism. And I was all I was like, damn it, he beat me to... Because I was... I was literally setting up to shoot the review myself when I saw the... On my uh, feed reader, I saw the, his review pop. I was like, shit. So, that was another one I was really expecting to not like. Just because, two things. It's another one of those movies that's filmed in like a, a documentary handheld style. And I'm, I'm notoriously pessimistic about every one of those. Like, even Cloverfield. I was like, really? We're doing another one of these? So yeah, Last Exorcism comes up and I go, oh, it's another it's another one of those shaky things. And then the tangent. Whatever happened to the Poughkeepsie tapes? I remember seeing, like, really heavy. They were advertising on, like, movie trailers and, uh, and even TV. I saw, like, trailers for these things called the Poughkeepsie tapes. Which is supposed... I didn't even know what it's about. Because they, they were really keeping it under wraps. They're like, something happened in Poughkeepsie and they taped it. And I'm like, Really? What? And they're like, see you later. You're like, it's coming soon to theaters. You'll find out what happened at Poughkeepsie. And I'm like, something happened. They taped it. I'm like, ah. So, and then for some reason, it was just gone. Like nothing. Nothing came of the Poughkeepsie tapes. Maybe it came like direct to video, and I missed it. Apparently, it's a piece of shit. I don't know. I'd really love to review it if I could find the Poughkeepsie tapes. I, I like. It might be in development hell. Where it, like they pulled funding or something, I don't know. I would really love to know what happened to Poughkeepsie Tapes because that was one where the title alone was you're kind of sold on it. Like Poughkeepsie's just a funny name, but anyway. Second thing that really had me bummed out about the Last Exorcism was every time Eli Roth does anything, they have to put produced by Eli Roth at the top of it. No, like no matter how much involvement he had, it was like so that's it, I don't know why they're proud of this, but they do it. Like you know. The Hostel series. I don't think I don't think Eli Roth has touched the Hostel series since the first one, except maybe producing it. You know, like that's the, no, like bigger than anything else. They're like produced by Eli Roth, and so Last Last Exorcism. They say, from like they're like produced and from the mind of Eli Roth. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like Cabin Fever too. Apparently that one was pretty good. I still haven't seen that one. I'm gonna see it. But they're like uh, Cabin Fever too. I don't think Eli Roth had fuck all to do with that one. In fact, it was pretty. It, they chose a different director entirely. Who? Oh, bad day for memory for me. You can tell this is going to be a really fun day when my mind is gone like this. Who the fuck did that one? I really like the other movie you did. Shoot. Oh, well. Anyway. It'll come to me as soon as I, I'm getting caffeine in me, as you can clearly see. I'm worthless before I've sucked down, like, a Coke, two Cokes or something like that. <laughs> Which explains my current figure. Okay, uh, last asterism. I really this is another one. Maybe Brad and I are not so similar as I thought. Cause we like man, we talked the whole time, the whole time we were there. And so I was like, we have really similar taste in movies. This is like the second time we have just stone cold disagreed on a movie entirely. But I liked it. I th this reminds me of something else, but I'll get to this. Um. I really, really like The Last Exorcism. I mean, I, I walked in there expecting to really loathe this movie, and it was awesome! I'm trying to keep it down because it's really early in the morning. I don't want to wake people up. And, I, I, and, and what it comes down to, I don't think anybody really disagrees with the first part of this movie, where spoilers are going to be inevitable, so you're probably going to want to jump ahead quite a while if uh, you, you want to be surprised. Just if my my capsule review, if you want to see it, like if it looks at all interesting to you, go see it because it's really really good. And so here here come the spoilers, and I'll just I'll basically describe the movie to you. It's about this guy whose name is Cotton. Shit, my memory is just going. It's Cotton Marcus, I think it is. He's a, he's he's basically a preacher, but he's a charlatan. He's like a he's he's not really a preacher cuz he he makes it clear from the very beginning like he was raised in a very religious thing. He was raised by like an evangelical like Baptist dude. And so he was giving sermons at like the age of 6. You know, his dad was throwing him in in front of crowds. And so he's really disillusioned and jaded with the whole religion thing. You know, uh he's just been so he's he's had religion rammed down his throat his whole life, so he's just he's basically sick of it. And so he's been doing exorcisms, basically fake exorcisms, because people come to him and they're like, you know, they're they're all 
really full of religious fervor and you know whenever anything goes wrong people are really superstitious and so they don't think they're like the head spinning vomiting type of possessed but they're like you know they're like I have these impure thoughts preacher and I I have these horrible things that crawl inside my head and I I think I got the devil in me preacher you need to exercise me so it's not like it's it's really not like the father maris type of uh you know bladdy type of exorcism it, this is kind of the more mundane like they don't take it any less seriously but it's the more baptist style of exorcism where you know like this this smooth talking preacher in a white suit or a, a beige suit comes in and he does his whole routine where he's like i will not exercise the demon from you low and, and so and he puts his hand and pushes the guy back he's like oh ah. so that's the kind of exorcism he's talking about now he does deal in the more like people are legitimately freaked out but it's like it's not real he's not really doing exorcism he makes that clear so he's like you know he's got all these props to make it more theatrical and so he's he's a complete and total charlatan you know he's he's just a total fake but at the same time i thought this movie did a really amazing job in not making us hate this motherfucker because you can so easily turn this dude into just a piece of shit where he's taking these innocent people's money and he's taking advantage of their superstitions and and their beliefs and you know he's he's conning these people and he is but we still like him anyway and so i was reading this great book that ed glazer gave to me called called save the cat which is a book on screenwriting pardon me and it's one of the key things about that movie is you have to make the audience like the hero and want him to succeed and you do that by having him save the cat or something you know something something really endearing about this guy that the audience can latch onto and make us really really like him so for instance they go like pulp fiction you know these two guys are hitmen with really bad hair and they're they're these foul mouth motherfuckers who who kill people for money and so these guys are not the most natural of heroes you know like there's no reason to cheer for these guys so what do they do in pulp fiction to make us like them they make them funny they make them tell that really great story about the the royal with cheese. They argue about the the you know the the boss who had a guy pushed out a window for rubbing his wife's feet, giving his wife a foot massage. Tony Rocky Horror. You know. So they give us reasons to like these guys, and you have to do that. You have to give people a really quirky moment or something that's that you know, anybody can like and latch onto. And so with this guy, he's. He's per, he, like he's providing a legitimate service to these guys. He's like, yes, okay, look, I don't believe in this shit, and I never believed in God or the devil, or I don't believe in these exorcisms, but I'm helping people. And he's like, he's like these, you know, he shows. Uh, I, I don't know if they show it, but they probably should have if they didn't. But you know, he's he he's honestly like whether whether he believes it or not, they believe it. Like they. Because these people are pretty much just mentally disturbed. You know, they've got something inside of them, and if they want an exorcism to make them feel better, he'll do it. And sure enough, they feel better, and they pay him for this. So he's putting on a show. They're they're basically paying him to put on a show. So he puts on the show. They feel better. He walks away. Everyone's happy. You know. So it's it's one of those kind of debates where like it's fake, but it's what they paid for. You know, and he's he's delivering a service, and he delivers that service now. You could argue one or the other, but the point is, with the movies going on, we really like this guy. And it helps that this is such an expertly crafted beginning of the movie, and it's so well acted. Like, all of these actors from the beginning to the end are shockingly good. It, it really helps that we like Cotton. It likes that we, we like the actor that plays Cotton, because he's so good. And he knows, he knows that line he's trying to walk, where he's playing, he doesn't play a greasy type of dude where he he doesn't play the the kind of slimy dude he plays the kind of smiling man that you'd like to see in a preacher you know he plays that very genial uh happy type of the, the guy you can relate to the guy you'd like to see on stage performing and you see him performing when he starts reading his banana his mom's banana bread recipe to a crowd of you know it, it, actually that's the moment that's the moment exact moment where you you turn to like this guy where he's like you know, at some point, it's not about the. It's about the the feeling. You know, it's about the uh, the spirit that's within you when I'm talking. It's not about the words themselves. I could be saying anything up there. You know, as as long as I'm filling up with the Holy Spirit, as long as I'm getting them fired up about something about God, as long as they think they're getting fired up about God, I could be saying fucking 
anything. Like, I could be reading my grandma's banana bread recipe up there, for Christ's sakes. And as long as I was saying it, like, getting them pumped up about the Lord, you know, they'd love it. And the, the person holding the camera's like, bullshit. I think, in fact, that's the exact word. I think they say bullshit. And he's like, oh, you want to bet? Like, and it's like 50 bucks. I'll, I'll start preaching my grandma's banana bread recipe. And so he gets up there, and he, he's like, first you mash up two bananas, and then you put them in the bowl. And people are like, hallelujah. And, he, like, that's the moment. That's the, and actually, like, I, I can see quite a few people getting, like, really direly offended by that. But that's the save the cat moment where he, he gets in front of these people and he he does something really, really funny, you know, and, and he, he kind of he kind of proves his point about the whole exorcism thing. So in that one fell swoop, that one moment, that's the one we really going to like this guy, and we do. And so that, that, that first three quarters of the movie, in fact, you could probably say like seven-eighths of that movie, is this really well-acted character study of... Mainly the preacher, and also the family, but it's mainly the preacher as he goes through this journey, and as you might expect, he's going on his last exorcism because he's retiring from the business. He read in the news about some kid who had an exorcism done by a guy very similar to him who asphyxiated to death and died, and so he's like, this is dangerous. I can't, I, you know, people are getting killed. You know, the, the, it was kind of fun and games, but, you know, we really are putting these people through the ringer, and, you know, physically, there is a danger here, so he's like, I have to stop. So I'm doing this last one, I'm going to make sure it's perfectly safe, and I'm going to basically expose the business because I can't be a part of this anymore. You know, I, I, have, to, I, have, I have to basically expose this whole exorcism is for the bullshit it is. So that's the story. And this is not huge spoilers, <coughs> pardon me, let me take a drink. This is not huge spoilers. Of course, this last one doesn't go well. <laughs> and I think they probably show you just about everything that happens when the sexism goes bad in the trailer so that's that's part of what that's the main point of the movie is the sexism goes really really bad because she starts to freak out she starts to legitimately freak out and what I really liked about this movie is that you th you think you know where this is going because if you've seen The Exorcist hmm you, you, you've pretty much got it like played out in your head like this is going to be kind of the same type of movie where You've got this kid who's writhing and screaming profanities on the bed, and she's puking, and the, the paintings on the wall are shaking, and we're like, holy shit, this is real, you know? And there's there's guys surrounding the bed saying, the power of Christ compels you! Ah! You know, and like, you know, you kind of have this mental image in your head the way this is going to play out. And so, I can tell you now that this is not that kind of movie. You think you know what this movie is, but you don't. Um... And so I'm always really happy when a movie does not turn out to be exactly what I expect. When that screenplay that I have in my head, like I can go beat for beat and kind of name out these movies, which is kind of what The Expendables was. There I go again. Um, this movie is, it does not deliver what is expected, but in a good way, where it kept me guessing. It, it was not, for instance, there's a big question up until the very end of the movie whether or not this girl is really possessed by the devil. Because she's freaking out and she's doing really weird stuff. Like she's contorting and swearing in Latin and things like that. But nothing really happens to where it's unexplainable. Like is she just really mentally ill or is she possessed? Because the, remember, the Reverend here does not believe in the devil. He doesn't really believe in these possessions. And so he's seen people do weird stuff. Very similar to this, actually. Not quite as... Like, when she shows up in his hotel room and she has no way of knowing where his hotel is, that's kind of freak out. Like, he starts to like, oh, shit, what the fuck is this? Like, But he never really instantly goes, like, oh, this is real. Like, this is the devil, like, right now. Because he doesn't believe in that shit. So, he's... From the beginning, his concern is, like, we really, like... He does the exorcism and it doesn't take. Like, she still starts freaking out. And so he's like, you know, she's got problems that run deeper than the simple kind of stuff that I put on my show and you feel better about yourself and we're all happy. You know, she really has mental problems because she's making these pictures, she's hurting herself, she's killing animals. And so, like, she's, she's got some deep-seated issues here and we need to get her, if not committed, we need to get her talking to some professional here. And so that's... That's the real question that's through this entire movie is you're, you're kind of wondering, 
things get worse and worse, and she gets more and more deranged to the point where you really start to believe that she is legitimately possessed. Because, like, at one point, she starts breaking her fingers. You know, she says, like, I'll leave if you can stay quiet for ten seconds. And the, pre- the preacher's like, good, fine, I'll do it. Like, if you get, like, it's a deal. And so she goes, one, and like, you're like, ah, oh, shit, like, she is fucking out of her mind. Like, and so when, when she starts, like, snapping her fingers one by one, counting to ten, you're like, this chick's fucked up. Like, she has to be possessed, right? You know? So that's the question that goes through the entire movie. And so what everyone mentions about this movie at the end is the ending. And... The ending comes com- for a lot of people came completely out of left field, and they walked out. And like Brad said, it induced laughter. It induced complete and utter disbelief, like head shaking, like what were they thinking? Type of disbelief as they were leaving the theater. You know, like that the ending that that was so bizarre. You just like it, I know Brad was walking out there going like, what the fuck were they thinking making an ending like that? Because it was so just. They're like, what? You know, like ex- that exact, like, what the fuck is this? And so I was expect. I, I knew there was a weird ending going into this one. But that's as much as I knew. So I was expecting, like, what, do aliens land? Like, what? Does her head, like, split open and there's a dog inside, like, with little levers in her head? And they're like, dog! <laughs> I don't know. And so I knew there was kind of something disturbing, but I didn't know what. And so, and this is what I said where I, I really like the fact this movie kept you guessing. Where the ending came and I thought, oh, that was the ending that they were talking about. Like, that was... It's okay. Major game-ending spoilers here. Shut it down if you don't want to know. It turns out she's not really possessed. Because she's, she's acting all freaky and she's contorted to where she's, like, literally bending over backwards. And you're like, that's a silly... Full of fuck me, man. And so she start, she's this naive country girl who lives in like the bayous of Louisiana. And so she said she she throws out a sexual term. She says, "Would you like a blowing job?" And the guy's like, "What?" And she's like, "A blowing job, preacher. Would you like one?" And he he he's like, "Ah, I get it." He's like, "He's like a blowing job, huh?" And she's like, "Yeah." He's like, do you even know what that is? And she's she starts to lose confidence, and she's like, you know, a demon would know what a blowjob is, but you have no fucking clue. You're not possessed. You're just freaking out. I see a really scared girl right now, and so she she breaks down, and she's like, you're right. I don't know what I was thinking. And so I was like, that's what it is. This whole time we were dealing with an exorcism, and the audience kind of latches onto this thing. We're like, she's really possessed, preacher. Get the fuck out of there. And it turns out she's just crazy, you know. So. That was like, and they're driving home, and she confesses that she she had this. She got really disturbed when she got knocked up by some guy who works at a diner, and so they're like, you know what? Let's go visit that guy who works at the diner because I need to see this guy. You know, like I, I this guy is an asshole. Like this guy is just, you know, he did this to her, and she he's denying it, and. You know, it really disturbed her. He needs to go visit her and patch things up with this guy. So I think his name is Logan or something like that. So they go to the diner, and it turns out Logan could not possibly be the father of the child. Just to say he's he's not, and they believe him. You know, so they're like, that's weird. If he's not the father, who is? Why would she lie about that? You know, we've kind of, haven't we really pulled the veil back on this one? And they're like, wait a minute. So they start putting things together, and they're like, something's not right. Wait a minute. Wait. And so they, they, they start to put things together about how all the things in her story, which she eventually did come clean, she tells them the whole story. And as they're driving back, you know, they're like, they start to put together the pieces. They, they, they don't fit. You know, they're like, why would she lie about that unless... Oh, shit. And so then I thought that was the ending. I thought, oh, she's really possessed. And, like, she's possessed by the prince of lies because that's what they start to call the demon inside. They're like, don't listen to the devil. It's the prince of lies. Don't listen to it. And so I'm like, oh, the devil's clever. The devil, to get the preacher away, basically double psyched him out, like lied about not knowing what a sex act was to get him away, you know, to to make it so her dad... The, the other story was her dad was like, if you don't exercise my girl... I'm going to take a shotgun and blow her fucking head off. Because that's the only way to save her, Preacher, you said, was to kill her. 
So I was like, oh, the, the devil knows that if he talks the preacher into saying that it's not really a devil inside her, then her father won't kill her and she can continue to live. You know, so I was like, oh, she really is possessed by the devil. And now that they've left her alone with the family, like, oh, no. So I fully expected them to come back to the farm and find that everyone was dead, like, flayed open, like, in Silence of the Lambs and, like, like stapled to the ceiling and, like, just gutted out. I was like, oh, that's the ending where she, she said she wasn't possessed, but she is possessed and they're all dead. And so, like, that's how I would have ended it, you know. So, so they go back and they show, like, sure enough, the house is covered in satanic imagery, but nobody's there. And they're like, what the fuck is this? Maybe she really was possessed, dude. And so they start to hear, like, drums in the distance, okay? And they're like, what the fuck is that? And so they go outside. And this is where they should have just gotten in the car and drove away. In fact, there's a lot of moments in this, sh in this movie where... They really should have just gotten in the car and driven the fuck away. Like, for me, it would have been when the chick starts, she gets out of her room early on, when they still don't know that she's possessed or not. But she starts acting really bad. And she takes, she takes like, a fucking knife. And she, she like, cuts this dude's face and acts the preacher with a knife and his hands all cut up. And that moment, I'm gone. I don't care if she's possessed by the devil. Bitch has got a blade. Bitch is cutting people. I'm calling the police, okay? And they're like, the, the preacher's like, she's only 16, we can overpower her. I'm like, no, fuck that, she's got a knife. She's gonna shove that knife in my eyeball and then twist it around like a corkscrew. Fuck you. I'm not staying in this fucking house. But there was a few moments where like, crazy white people, get out of the house! <laughs> and so they don't get out of the house because the guys, it makes sense at the time, but it can e you can easily see people like just get in the car and fucking leave. So, back to where I was going. They go back to the house. House is covered in satanic imagery, and they start hearing, like, drums or some shit. And they're like, what the fuck is that? So they go follow the sound of the drums. Stupid move, by the way. But they're like, we, like, like, we have to warn the family. Because he's really concerned about her. And they, they really sell that fact where the preacher is really concerned about her. Because he has a really sick son. And he's, that's why he's doing this job, is because he has to pay the medical bills for his... I think the, the son is... Um, I can't remember what the condition he has, but he was born like two months early, and he has a whole bevy of physical problems like deafness and um, mental retardation. I, I don't know what the exact term for it is, but he's very premature, and so he has to pay these bills to save his son. So he has a very protective attitude about both his son and the possessed girl. So he's like, we have to save her. If something's wrong, we have to go save her. I'm like, call the cops. But they go into the forest, and they, they, they cut through the woods, and they all of a sudden they see this bonfire. And I'm like, what the fuck? Is and so they, they, there's, there's these, like, 30 dudes. Like, everyone in town is circled around this bonfire. And they got the, they got the possessed chick, or the chick who was possessed, Nell. Um, she's on, like, this altar. Her legs are spread out. And, hang on, her legs are spread out. And the nice lady from the church is like, like face deep in her between her legs, like pulling something out of her body, and they're like, they're like, what the fuck? It's like a cult, and the the nice church lady pulls like this demon out of her belly and holds it up, and it's all red and like translucent and glowing and like, <laughs> it's like Rosemary's Baby. In fact, I think Brad exactly said Rosemary's Baby wants its ending back. So, like, they pull this demon out of her, and they're like, Azazel, come into this world! And then they pitch the fucking demon baby into the bonfire, and the bonfire, like, erupts in, like, nuclear flame, and this demon, like, this, this demon made of fire comes out. It's like, Aah! And they're like, and the preacher's like, you know, in that moment, the preacher's faith is resolved. He's like, whoa, my, there's a fucking demon there. And so, like, he whips up his cross, and he whips out his Bible, and he starts approaching the fire. He's like, be gone, demon. Camera crew's like, I've had enough of this shit. Camera crew fucking books, and they all die. Because the cult chases them down and kills them. And so, people are like, a cult? Like, what? Like, so I, I just know, like, I was loving it. I was, like, they go through the woods, and they see the bonfire, they see the cult, and they pull this demon child out of the, out of the, out of the, 
out of the chick, and I was going, oh, of course! Ah! Like, th- th- they had, like, three perfectly good endings, and, like, like, they just kept twisting it. Like, I loved it! it like, it was like, it made sense to me. Like, I was like, this is per Like, I walked out of there going, that was perfect! The cult! Of course! And it made sense. It really did make sense. And I'll try to explain for you how it didn't make sense. It, or how it did make sense, I'm sorry. But, like, I sympathize. I really do. Like, because my brother's point... I, I wish my brother was here. Because we were going to do this before I left, but I was so busy getting ready. So, my brother's like, you know, here's what it is. I'm going to be my brother for a second. This is, this is my brother. He's like, here's what it is. You've got this great movie. You've got this great character study with these with these fantastic actors who are telling the story about how this guy is performing basically a fake service for a bunch of yokels, you know. And so, from the beginning, where this guy this guy has a lot of faith in science and he doesn't believe in this devil shit, and it kind of plays us for rubes, because you know from the beginning of this movie, from the trailer. From the poster, from everything that happens in this movie, we, the audience, are kind of believing, like, she's really possessed, dude, get the fuck out of there, like, this is real now, like, like we're watching this whole movie, she's breaking her fingers, she's doing weird things in the, in the lawn, and she's talking in Latin, and she's showing up at his hotel, and we're like, dude, like, and the preacher's like, she's just sick, okay, she's mentally ill, and the audience... Pretty much everyone in the audience is going, she's not, dude! She's possessed by the devil this time! Like, you, you didn't see the trailers, dude! I did! So, like, this whole time we're screaming, like, get the fuck out! It's a real demon! And so, at the end, it turns out she's just mentally ill. And she's been... She's just... She's really smart. She's insane, not stupid, you know? So she's been studying Latin. She knows all this stuff. She knows the lore, and she knows how to fake it. She's just insane. She's not in full control of her faculties, let's say. And so, he's like, you could end the movie right there. And I would have said that was a great movie. Because it takes the whole premise of this guy playing the audience for fools. This guy kind of playing on their superstitions. Doing this phony exorcism. And we walk away going like, oh, wow. I needed that, you know. So you could have gone on this tangent where... You end the movie, and we, we all feel really stupid. We're like, of course. She couldn't have... Like, what were we thinking? She was possessed. Like, why should this be any different? You know, like, th- this was just another case for him. It was a really violent case for him, but... Why should... Like, we, he's never seen any instance of God or the devil or something like that, you know? So, he's like, you know, you had this really great character study. You could have ended it right there. And you could have made a really good point. You know... That there's no devil here, you know, this is just, he's, it's just people, you know, crazy people. And I'm like, I I can't disagree with that. Now, what I can't say is that the ending is completely unearned. Like, this this comes out of nowhere, nowhere. I don't buy that. In fact, I can come up with a lot of examples why it's not true. Because from the beginning, the guy is driving through Louisiana, and he's like, you know, this is a really weird place. This place, more than any other, is a real melting pot of religion because you've got a lot of you've got a lot of uneducated people here. Not to say that religious people are uneducated or stupid. I'm just saying, like he's like, you know, around here, spiritualism is really big because there's not a lot of there isn't a lot of higher education around here. So people latch on to God, and is there's a lot of almost like primitive spiritualism around here because you've got a mixture of Pentecostalism, uh, Baptist religion, you know, Christianity, voodoo. And so you've got, like, in a lot of cases, you have these really mixed up practices that, that blend and swirl and make really weird stuff. And so he's like, he's like, and, and, and people really buy into the whole devil and the influence of evil around here. It's like, if you ask five people for a devil story, you'll walk away with ten devil stories. And sure enough, he does this. He starts asking these people at gas stations, like, do you have any devil stories? Or something? Do you have any stories about weird stuff that happens around here? And sure enough, like, all these people have stories about possession, um, cultists. They actually refer to, like, 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 three people who say, like, there's a cult around here. And he and he's like, oh, oh, oh you guys, you, you backwards rubes. And so there's another guy tells him about a UFO. And he's like, you want to see where the UFO landed? And he's like, no, that's okay. I, that's that's fine. You know, so 
So they foreshadow this thing. They really do. I thought they built up to that well. And so you start to wonder. They start to ask him, like, well, as they're driving away, and they're like, well, she's pregnant, though. If he didn't knock her up, who did? And why won't she admit to who knocked her up? Like, she's already kind of come out as being kind of crazy. Like, why would she lie about this? And why would she make such an obvious lie, you know, for this guy? And so they start to ask, like, and so it turns out that it's a cult she's been impregnated with some demon child. And so if you look back on the movie, it makes sense. Because the father's not in on it. The father is this really religious dude who really wants to exterminate this devil, but everyone else in town is not as uh, devout as this guy because they're in this cult. And so what you start to question, like, well, what, if she's not possessed, why is she acting this way? Like, why... Because something is clearly wrong here. Like, she's she did pick up all this really weird stuff. Like, the Latin and the... You get the sense that she really is possessed because she's doing weird shit. You know? And so they're like, it doesn't really add up. And so when it turns out she really is possessed, she's the vessel for this demon. It makes so much more sense, the, the fact that they... Pretty much everyone in town wants to stop this guy, wants to stop this exorcism. In fact, even the son is in on this cult, and the son hates this dude. As soon as he arrives, hates this motherfucker, right? Like, comes in, sees this dude as a preacher. He's like, I'm going to perform an exorcism on your sister. He's like, you get the fuck out of here right now, preacher man. Like, you get the fuck out. And so he starts throwing rocks at him. And so, but when it becomes obvious that the guy is a fraud, that the guy is, like, making these demonic signs like making the water boil and making his crucifix smoke the guy's like you know i saw you adding stuff to the water you know i I know that you're a fake and the preacher's like is that gonna be a like do we have a problem you and me like he's like because he doesn't he doesn't play he doesn't tell this guy obviously that he's a fake but he's like he's like i don't know what you're talking about son but is there gonna be a problem between us because you've been acting like an asshole this whole time you know and, but as soon as the kid realizes the preacher's a fake and that he is an actual no risk of actually exercising the demon, kid loves him. Yes, it's like kid, the kid basically is like grinning ear to ear. He's like, you know, I saw you adding the shit to the water to make it boil. And he's like, the preacher's like, and I don't know what you're talking about. And the kid's like, nothing, nothing. I think you and I are going to get along just fine. And he leaves because he knows the kid's safe. The demon is safe. He's not going to do anything to hurt this kid. He's not going to do anything to actually hurt the demon. He can't. He's vague. So the, the the brother is like perfect. I got like if it was a real preacher, he'd have fucking killed him at some point. But he's not. He's like oh, whatever. You know, he, he's like in fact, you're going to do everything you can to make sure she's safe to deliver this child. This works great. So, and so there's another moment where the son gets his face cut because she's acting all crazy. And he passes her a note in secret saying, don't leave her alone with her father. You know, and the reason being is because her father wants to blow Nell's head off with a fucking shotgun because he really does believe that she's possessed and she, he is not in this cult. And so the, the guy thinks that the son is telling him that the son has a motive for wanting to save her because he's in the cult. He wants the baby to be born and he knows that the father will kill her. So he's like... He actually tasks the preacher with saving the child. I was like, it makes perfect sense to me. So they go into the field. They see this cult. And to me, it was very Lovecraftian. Because, in fact, in, in the Call of Cthulhu story, there basically is a moment exactly like that, where I think they even go into the bayous of Louisiana, and they kind of part the woods, and they see the cult dancing around, and that's where they find this Cthulhu idol. And so it's not really Cthulhu, but... If you can definitely see like a Lovecraftian influence there, where that's basically how a lot of Lovecraft stories end, you know, I was like, I thought it was brilliant. And so, I'm not saying that you're honestly. This is one of those moments where I'm saying Brad is right and I'm right and we're both right, and I, like my brother is right. So you know, I can easily see people walking away from this movie really frustrated, like. You had this movie ended. You had it. You had a great movie. You had a great even. You even had a message, and I can even agree with you. I'm like, you know what? You could have on a DVD. You could have ended that movie right there. You could have rolled credits. Everyone's happy and like, ah. 
and or you could have ended the cult way. And I would I love the I love the cult ending. You could have made that a really great alternate ending. Whatever. My main complaint against the cult ending, and this is a big one. In fact, this is probably the biggest one. Is at the end of the movie, they all get discovered. They're they're like the preacher runs out in the middle of the clearing trying to ex like I don't know what the fuck he's trying to do. Like is he trying to banish the demon with his fake crucifix? I don't know. The camera crew runs away and they get butchered because the cultist like the the cultist takes like a sickle and like cuts the cameraman's head off and it ends like every one of those. It, it ends Blair Witch style where the camera hits the ground and it, you know. My question. How did they? How did anyone find this footage? It ends in such a way where this footage would never see the light of day. You know, like the cameraman. The cameraman literally gets killed by the last by the cultists. You know, and so like the camera hits the ground. There's no way the cultists didn't see this big honking shoulder-mounted camera. And what did he do? Did he like sell it to America's Funniest Home Videos? Like that's a, that's a pretty big plot hole. Where like you know, then the Blair Witch. They're like, you know, these, these hikers went missing and like three months later we found their footage somewhere. It's like some hikers found their footage. Okay, fine. But these cultists, no way did they leave that laying around, you know. No way did this camera hit the ground and they're like, eh, it's not going anywhere. Like, there's nothing to it. I mean, like, you can't argue that they didn't know how a camera works, you know. They probably would have just thrown everything in the fire anyway. But, like, that's a big one. You know, like, where the fuck did this... Where the fuck? You know, this could not have possibly happened. So that's another really good argument for the the not have that ending idea where, like, you know, they go away. They're like, well, that was fucked up. Good thing she wasn't really possessed, you know. And then they're like, they just made the movie. You know, this is the movie they made out of their footage. Yeah. Second major thing that I, I never like when they do this. And it's it's a lot more subtle here, but they still do it. Is they added uh, an orca- a musical score. They added like orchestra strings and like background music to this movie, which you never want to do in a movie that is supposedly found footage for a documentary. The found footage thing should never have uh, background music or orchestral music, like that subtle mood music that goes along when they're driving around and there's music. Never. You never want to do that. And it's subtle here, so you may not even notice it. I noticed it, but you, you like it works. The, the music isn't bad. But what it does is, in a very subtle way, reminds you that this isn't real. And I know, I, I know what you're saying. Like, you're like, it's not real. But I'm like, I know, I know. But in terms of suspension of disbelief, this is supposed to be found footage of this guy getting killed by cultists. Or this is supposed to be footage of a monster attacking New York City. Or this is supposed to be footage of hikers getting lost in the woods. What ruins your ability to believe that is music in the background. You know, artificially in post-production music put in the background. It dispels that illusion somewhat. Because this is something that a studio has tinkered with. This is something that wouldn't, you wouldn't have music in this footage. You know, it's fake. You want it to be real. You want people to believe it's real. And the acting is good enough that you do believe it's real. Or at least you're willing to accept the fact that these aren't actors. Like, they don't act like actors. They're not melodramatic. They're not, like... You can tell when somebody is, like, affecting a character. These people feel more real. And so when the music is in the background, it really bothered me. And this is no more evident than in Diary of the Dead, where, in fact, not only is there music in the background... And two, it's really, really bad music. In fact, there's actually comic relief music, which is shockingly stupid. But there's actually a moment in the movie where the lady who's putting together the footage says, the events you're about to see are shocking and horrific, and to punctuate them, I've added music of my own. Something like that. There's like a line where she says, I've added music to punctuate the the atmosphere, and I'm like, you added mood music to your documentary of the zombie apocalypse. Like, if this was real, can you imagine them adding mood music to, I hate to bring this up as an example, 9-11? Like, like if somebody says, this 9-11 thing is pretty shocking, but I've added music to really drive it home. So, like, if you've got this, if you've got this 
documentary about the zombie apocalypse. And the guy says, oh, yeah, this is pretty scary watching all of Earth's cities overrun by the Walking Dead, but I've had decided to add a little music just to really punch you in the gut, you know. So this was probably the least offending of the of the group was uh, Last Exorcism, but there it is. You know, I was like, just if I were making a cut of this movie, I wouldn't add the music. Just, just not that. So that's my review of the Last Exorcism. I've probably talked about this for like forty minutes. In fact, what time is it? It is six fifteen. About. So I'm probably going to talk about other M in another video. So I'm going to cut here. And yeah, um, but yeah, like I disagreed with Brad on this one just because. But again, I don't think Brad thinks it was time poorly spent. I just think he walked away going like, "What were they thinking with the fucking ending? That was so stupid." And I get you know, and, and I don't know, maybe it was just the mood I was in. But I, I dug it. I dug the hell out of it, and so I, I it, tonally, it is way different. Like I, I, I'm not disagreeing with anybody who who didn't like the ending actually I'm saying like they're like it came out of nowhere I'm like kind of I, I would actually somewhat disagree with you there that it didn't completely come out of nowhere but it is completely unlike anything that had been seen thus far in that movie where you're like there's a cult there and there's something a demon when this whole movie when this whole movie were like it's not real <laughs> you know you were just being silly I get it but honestly I like either way I don't think you'll be unhappy you know you'll watch if if I, I'll admit I'm a big sucker for the exorcism movies because I'm not I'm not all that religious I gotta tell you, but for some reason the whole exorcism thing I, I just I get a giggle out of it. I love watching all those movies. I liked watching um, this isn't an exorcism movie but the prophecy because that's Christopher Walken in it. I love the Exorcist. Hated two. Love number three. So um, I love the exorcism of Emily Rose, which I consider to be kind of a cross between Law and Order and the Exorcist. I like that one too. Uh, I know a lot of people hated Exorcism of Emily Rose. So, once again, if you want to know, like, I am not an unbiased journalist. So, I like I said, I'm kind of a sucker for all these movies. But I still think, you know, on its own merits, it's a good film. So, check it out. I, actually, I'm sorry it took so long to make this review because by the time this review hits the internet, it might not be in the theaters much longer. It was really kind of a minor release, but I liked it. So, check it out.